Friends, we know that it's been 50 years, 50 years since the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And as we remember the legacy and the work of Dr. King today, there are two moments in history that are forever etched in the memory of most, regardless of generation. When 250,000 demonstrators gathered at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. in 1963, when Dr. King gave that famous speech, I have a dream. And when five years later, in 1968, when he was assassinated, they killed the dreamer. But thanks be to God, they did not kill the dream. Let me say that again. They killed the dreamer, but thanks be to God, they did not kill the dream. Because we do see that dream being manifested in the ongoing fight for equality. The ongoing fight for peace and justice across this nation and around this world. Now for some, these memories are enough to behold. But for others of us, Dr. King's life has instilled in us a moral obligation. Let me say that again a moral obligation to join the struggle for freedom and equality for all. Now, Dr. King's dream, as powerful and poetic and memorable as it was, it was more than just lofty ideals, more than just cherished aspirations and ambitions. But King's dream was revolutionary. Let me hear you say revolutionary. It was a prophetic call to a change in the social order of society. It was a dream that confronted racism and poverty and injustice and the nightmare conditions of American cities. His dream was an undying passion for the marginalized. His dream was a call to action. His dream was and still is a movement. Now King said that his conscience, hear this, his conscience left him no other choice but to seek and to act out against injustice. He says because it comes a time when silence is betrayal. It was his conscience. How is your conscience leading you today? In his book, Stride Toward Freedom, King writes, to accept passively an unjust system is to cooperate with that system. Thereby, the oppressed become just as evil as the oppressor. Non-cooperation with evil is just as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. King was quite clear about who and what was at the root of human suffering. And he talked about racism. He talked about militarism. He talked about poverty as the giant triplets of interrelated evil. And he said it is that that has to be overcome if society is to be transformed. And it is that that stands as a barrier to our living into what we know and seek as beloved community. Yes. It's been 50 years, yes. 50 years, and the battle has still not been won. Yes. Racism and classism still continues to play a role in American society and defines who we are as Americans. Yes. Segregation and racism still exist in our school systems in our church systems, in our political systems, among our law enforcement, our healthcare systems, our prison systems, our immigration policies, and in all other sectors of society. Disproportionate numbers of ethnic persons who are at the victims of homelessness, joblessness, and food insecurity. As a nation, we still spend more money on mass incarceration and military defense than public education. 
my friends, I don't have to stand here and remind you that race impacts our society in ways that we don't even realize. And it is defined in every American public policy, whether we're willing to admit it or not. I am convinced that if we want to pay tribute to Dr. King for having a dream, if we want to galvanize the nation to continue to strive toward ongoing freedom and equality, we can keep having these wonderful celebrations, and they are good. They are blessed. We can do this every year. We can continue to say, we shall overcome and kumbaya. And we can walk away feeling real good because we have remembered, we have celebrated, we have heard the speeches, and it feels good to remember. But if we want to keep the dream alive and commit to the work and the vision of King, we have to face our current realities of our times and admit that we have a societal problem and we're part of a societal problem because we have become silent. One of the problems that we have is that whenever we talk about race, whenever we talk about racism, it elicits cautious conversations. Cautious, be careful, because we get emotional. We get passionate, which leads to paralysis of conversation. It becomes more of a monologue than a dialogue because it takes effort and it takes boldness and it takes courage to be in the conversation. But we gotta quit letting people change the conversation. We need to have conversations on racial inequality. I am told by some colleagues and friends that they can't even discuss matters of race among each other. They can't talk about it. Some folk can't even talk about it in their households. Our churches can't even have the conversation. Can't even have it in our mosque and our synagogues because some just don't feel comfortable. We don't feel safe. We don't feel prepared. We don't want to be judged. Well, guess what? Not talking about it ain't going to make it go away. We are living still in denial. And too often the media makes a mockery out of this denial which creates more divisiveness among us and perpetuates fear and hatred and suspicion and mistrust and anxiety. Just take a look at our socio-political landscape. We already heard it be said in some of our comments on social media. When you have a president who was supposed to be held to the highest regard, to the highest ideals, but yet too many of us are silent. We get mad for the moment, but then we go to sleep at night and tomorrow we wake up and it's a different day. But guess what, nothing has changed. And until the church begins to speak, and until the church begins to act, until the church begins to say, no more, this is not acceptable. I am convinced that fear and racism are cancers to our society. And they threaten to destroy the very fabric of who we are as a people of God and who we are as Americans, people of faith and this beloved community. But guess what? As a people of faith, as a people who are called to have a conscience, we have a moral obligation, yes, to love the Lord with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. But we also have a moral obligation to love our neighbor as ourselves. We have a moral obligation to help keep dream, King's dream alive. And his dream that is embedded in God's vision for God's beloved community. But we must be willing to declare that Dr. King's dream will not die on our watch. Will not, shall not die on our watch. Micah 6, 8 says, he has told you, O mortal, 
what God requires of you, not what he asks of you, not just when you feel like it, not if you feel safe, not if you want to, what the Lord requires of you, but to seek justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Amos 5, 24 says what? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Yes, yes, yes. Isaiah reminds us, learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Defend the case of the widow. King reminds us that it's not enough for the church to be active in the realm of ideas. And don't we know we got a lot of ideas? I sit in a lot of meetings around a lot of tables at every level of the church. We are full of what? Ideas. But what he says to us, that it's not enough just to be active in the realm of ideas, but to move into the arena of what? Social action. Vincent Harding, who's a noted historian who worked very closely with Dr. King, he says this, the most profound thing I learned from Martin Luther King was that change does not come automatically. Things do not change. People who are committed to change, who are change makers, have to decide what kind of change they want to commit to. So I ask you today, will the dream die on your watch? I think it was Cornell West who said to us, there are two things we have no control over. When we are born and the day that we will die, the only thing we do have control over is that dash. So the question becomes, while you are still living in the blood running warm through the veins of your body, will you be a part of the change? We can pray and we can worship and we can study, but friends, we got to do better. We have to do more. We must speak out and begin to mobilize and organize for action. Organize people with organized resources is what? Organized power. We must engage in ministry with the poor, the marginalized, the disenfranchised, and be a voice for the voiceless. We cannot be silent. Yes. I hear it often be said, oh, these are difficult times. I hear it be said, I mean, we have fallen on what? Hard times. I even said, heard it be said that these are what? Perilous times. Some folks say that these are anxious times, and yes, they are. But let me tell you, it's deeper than that. These are tumultuous times. These are dangerous times in which we are living. Martin Luther King said injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I think about some of the stereotypes that people make some of the derogatory statements and even still racist jokes about other folk and unhalved truths being told about people and races and ethnicities. Do you ever just stop and think and wonder, what makes some folk think that it's okay? That it's okay to disrespect, to disregard, to exclude, to cause undue harm to any one of God's beloved. What makes people think that it's okay? But I wonder, I wonder, every day I wake up and wonder. And I've been wondering this for every year I've been born. And as a matter of fact, I was sitting here listening and I was reminded that I was being carried in my mother's womb when Dr. King was assassinated. In my entire life, short-lived but long-lived, almost 50 years of life, I still wake up every day in wonder, what if all of us made it our moral imperative 
to make people feel ashamed for doing such injustice? What if that was our moral imperative? That we saw it as our God divine responsibility to turn deaf ear, to see and not act, to know and do nothing. We become part of the oppression, yes, even toward ourselves. King said his conscience would not allow him not to because he knew of the greater responsibility he had, but he would not be able to live with himself to do anything different. There is no such thing as partial bigotry. (laughs) We have to quit making excuses for people. And we have to quit making excuses for why we don't act. We can't do everything, but my God, can we do something? And make our minds up about what it is that we will do. But we can't do it by ourselves. We are so very blessed. I'm sitting here listening to all of our elected leaders, our politicians, our educators. This room is full of preachers and teachers and doctors and lawyers and students and everyday gifted individuals making a difference in the lives of society. We've got the power. And we need to quit acting like we don't. For too long, I, I, I read this one particular quote that someone once said that I've been down for so long that I've just gotten comfortable with just being down because I don't know nothing else. How much further can one be oppressed when you open your eyes and see all the people, who are the they that are down? Who are the they that are oppressed? Who are the they that have no voice? Who are the they that have no food and no shelter, who do not have access to education? Who are they? It is time for the church to rise up and be her best self. We are the moral conscious for society, but we must take our rightful place. It grieves my spirit when I see things happening in the media, in our communities. And my phone don't ring saying, Bishop, we're about to make a move here and we need you to help us gather others that we might come and speak out against this injustice. Or we have an opportunity to create some new programs. But we can't do this by ourselves, but we want to be able to organize that we might have greater impact. We have inroads right here in front of us who want to work with the church and not just them. And the them, they are us. Not just because of the color of their skin, because they care about the cause, Mm -hmm. the cause of justice. So what if, what if, what if the church were to be the body of Christ? a living, moving organism. What if we were to galvanize and organize? We have churches in every community. I sometimes look at some of these mega churches. I have a few around my house. And I'm going to be honest. A couple of times, Ashley is my witness. My family, now we, we've gone and visited a few of these trying to figure out what is it that they got going on where their parking lots are always full that we don't seem to have. And I will tell you, each and every time I walk away, not just because I was born and raised United Methodist and that's, it's in my blood, but each time I walk away, what I don't hear and what I don't see is the mission and the social justice as is at the center, the front for us. 
So when we talk about, no, we're not a, we don't have mega churches of thousand worshipers, but you put all of us together? We are a mega church, my friends. Not just here in Northeast Ohio, but we are part of a greater connection. So my challenge to us, don't let the dream die on our watch. I'm committed to the dream not dying on our watch. But we got to do more than pray. We got to do more than just coming to Bible study and getting into God's word, letting God's word get into us. It's all for the good, for transformation, but it's for a greater purpose of being sent. And we are those who are being sent. We are the called and the sent. Christ is depending on us. Don't you have a dream? What keeps you up at night? What bothers you in your spirit? What do you see that you just can't seem to live with or you get so unsettled about? It's time to shift from just dreaming and remembering and commemorating. Let us organize. Let us mobilize. And this transcends race and gender and class. But anyone who cares about the cause of justice, the cause of equality, the cause of peace, it is time. It is time. Repeat after me. I will, I will. not let, not let. The, dream the dream die on my watch. On my watch. I, will I will, not let. The dream dream. die on my watch. We better stay woke. But better yet, it's time to act. It's time to organize. Live the dream. Embody the dream. But more importantly, be the very embodiment of the love and the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.